Okay, hello. Welcome to uh, the Inspirited Networks Class B. I'm John Spellman, and uh, we've got uh, uh, Ali on the line with us as well. And uh, we're going to be talking today about the lost day of history, uh, focusing on this whole thing about the Sabbath. What is it? Uh, where did it come from? What does it mean? And do Christians today um, have to keep it? All right, so uh, we're going to start off, of course, with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for our opportunity that we can spend time together to study your word. And we pray, Lord, that the truth of the Sabbath would be made clear today as we delve into your word. Guide us, Lord, and direct us. This we ask in Jesus' name. And we ask, Lord, that those who are listening in and hearing this for the first time would have understanding and wisdom and that you would speak to their hearts even now. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So the first right. question of the night um, is, on what day did Jesus customarily worship? So um, if we turn our Bibles to Luke chapter 4 and verse 16, I'm sure that we'll find our answer. So if you have your Bibles with you, please turn to Luke chapter 4 and verse 16. And it says, and he, and he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. So what does this text tell us about um, what day Jesus customarily worshipped on? I think it's very clear in saying that it was Christ's custom to go to church every, every Sabbath day. That's right. He went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and set up for Cherie, and it was his custom. So. Mm-hmm. And I think uh, one of the things that I found clear about this text is that the custom wasn't the Sabbath itself. The custom was that on the Sabbath, he went to the, ch- to the synagogue and stood up to read. So Jesus was a keeper of the Sabbath, and his method of keeping the Sabbath customarily was to go to the synagogue and to read. So Jesus was a believer and a keeper of the Sabbath, not as only a custom, like just something that he did because he was Jewish, but that he kept the commandment of God. And he, um, you know, and and, uh, his custom in keeping it was that he read from the scriptures on the Sabbath day. Um, The second question that we have here, but which day of history has been lost? Well, we'll take a look at Exodus chapter 20. And uh, starting at verse 10. And it says, But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested on the seventh day, Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So we see here um, that uh, the Sabbath, the seventh day, was the day uh, that God had blessed and sanctified. But we're also going to look at Mark chapter 1 and uh, verses 1 and 2. Because how do we know which day is the seventh day? So Mark chapter 1, uh, sorry, Mark chapter 16, verse uh, 1 and 2. And when Can I the read? Sabbath was Yeah, sure, go ahead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome had bought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulchre at the rising of the sun. All right. So Let's, let's analyze this for a minute here. Um, in Exodus chapter 20, we read that the seventh day was the day that God had blessed and sanctified. And now when we turn to Mark chapter 16, it says that the Sabbath was passed. Okay? So immediately, once the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, uh, the mother of James and, uh, and Salome, had brought um, sweet spices uh, that they might come and anoint him. So this is... Um, In reference to the crucifixion, uh, Jesus was uh, crucified, and then um, 
he remained in the tomb on the Sabbath. And so once the Sabbath was passed, um, these women got together to bring um, these sweet spices to come and anoint him for the burial, right? Well, actually, he was already buried, but uh, they came to anoint him because after four days or, um, you know, a certain period of time, the body would begin to smell. And so they had sweet spices and things like that so they could anoint the body to prevent it from stinking. So once Jesus was in the grave, um, the Bible says that that, uh, these women waited for the Sabbath to pass, and then early in the morning on the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulchre at the rising of the sun. So this is what we now call Easter Sunday, right? So this was the first um, resur- well, this is the first uh, resurrection Sunday when Jesus was found to be um, resurrected from the tomb. So we know that once the Sabbath was passed and it was the first day of the week that Jesus rose again on Resurrection Sunday. So mm-hmm. if it was Sunday when Jesus rose and when these women had come on the first day of the week to anoint his body, then what day would the Sabbath have to be? The day before it would be Saturday. That's right. And we also know that Jesus was crucified on a Friday and that um, he was, um, they actually, because they knew that the Sabbath was going to to come, they actually wanted him to die faster. So uh, they were going to break his legs like they typically did to speed up the process by which he would die so as not to have him die on the Sabbath. Um, but when they had come to him after they broke the, 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 the knees of the other two thieves, well, uh, sorry, when he had broke the, knee, the, the knees of the two thieves, um, they um, had realized that Jesus was already dead. Mm-hmm. So there was no need. So Jesus died on Friday. Um, he stayed in the grave on Sabbath, and then he was resurrected on Sunday. So that shows us that Saturday would have to be the Sabbath, according to the Scripture. So that's just an easy way that we can that we can see that Jesus was indeed um, in the grave on the Sabbath, and that the Sabbath is Saturday. So we've established when the Sabbath is, but who made the Sabbath, and where did it come from in the first place? Any thoughts on that? Who made the Sabbath, and where did it come from in the first place? I think if we go back to um, the passage that we read in Exodus chapter 20, mm-hmm. um, starting from verse 10, it says, For the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy... And it continues. And if we go to verse 11, there's a reason for why we should keep the Sabbath. And it says, For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea and all that in them is, and he rested on the seventh day. And the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and he hallowed it. So I think that in this, in these two verses, we see where the, where the Sabbath, who it came from, who the Sabbath mm-hmm. came from, and, and the reason why we're supposed to keep the Sabbath. Because it's a, a memorial of creation, and that it's a, it's, it's God has placed his signature on the Sabbath, in a way, from putting his name associating his name with the commandment. That's, that's very true. And I think uh, a, lot of, a lot of different uh, churches out there um, say that um, the Sabbath was only for the Jews because it was given in the Ten Commandments. And so since the Ten Commandments were given to the Jewish people, they assumed that the, Ten Command- that the, uh, that the Sabbath commandment was not for all human beings, but only for Jewish people. But if we take a look at uh, even further back than Exodus, um, and we look at Genesis chapter 1, we see that, um, actually Genesis chapter 1 going to uh, chapter 2, we're going to find that the Sabbath wasn't made just for Jewish people, but the Sabbath was made for humanity. Um, and there's also even a text where Jesus says that the Sabbath was not made, uh, that men were not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was made for man. So when we look at those two ideas, we, we kind of get an idea that it's not just a Jewish tradition, but it is something that was set up by God. So Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And as we read down through Genesis, we read the whole account of creation history, all the way down to day 6 when man was created. And then in chapter 2, it gives us the conclusion of creation. It says, Thus the heavens 
and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made, and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he rested from all his work, which God created and made. So in this text, it tells us clearly that God rested on the seventh day. He ended his work on the seventh day, and he specifically blessed the seventh day. So that means that man is not at liberty to choose which day they want to rest on or at liberty to choose which day was sanctified because God blessed and sanctified a particular day. I think it would also help us if we kind of discuss what does it mean to bless and to sanctify something. Well, first, what about blessing? What do you think? Uh, I think blessing is can – I, can I answer for sanctify? I think it's easier. I think uh, – Sure, yeah. Um, <laughs> I think that when you sanctify something, it's when you sort of put it apart for, like, a particular use. Like, if you sanctify something, then you have set it apart for a holy use, for a holy purpose. And I guess blessing is also just putting putting sort of a, a sort of approval on something. I'm not sure. Okay. So sanctifying is definitely to set, it, to set something apart. Um, usually for holy use, right? So you're, and, and when you bless something, you're making it special. You're making it, um, you know, you're giving special honor to it. Um, okay. So we find that special honor uh, was given to the seventh day. It was set apart um, and, and, and made holy. Right. So we combine that with what we read in Exodus chapter 20, where it says, <laughs> um, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Uh, six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. And I want to just skip down a couple of verses to verse 11. It says, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So the word hallowed there means it's something purified. It's, it's sanctified. It's set apart. It's, it's, um, it's, it's made distinct, right? So right. Um, the only other times when that word is used, uh, you know, uh, it's used in the Lord's Prayer, for example, um, where we say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So the Sabbath is hallowed just like God's name is hallowed. It's special. It's made holy. Um, and it says here that, it's, remember, it's, it, it's the seventh day that's given this special significance. Mm-hmm. So going back to um, the text that we were just reading in Genesis, um, I want you to notice here that the seventh day is what's blessed, sanctified, hallowed, and made holy. But notice it doesn't say that men, in keeping the Sabbath, make it holy, but rather that the day itself is holy. So God here blessed and and set apart the the specific day. It's it's not blessed and sanctified because men choose to worship or choose not to worship on it. Regardless of whether man chooses to regard the, the special blessing that God put on the seventh day, it's still holy no matter what because God set it apart. So the Sabbath is holy whether or not men choose to keep it. Okay. And if you look at the commandment, it tells us to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. So notice that word, to keep it holy. That means it's already holy, holy even if we don't keep it. Mm-hmm. But God, God's command was just to remember it and to maintain it, to observe it as holy. So even before this commandment, the Sabbath was already holy. So um, the next question I wanted to throw out there, what does God say about Sabbath keeping in the Ten Commandments, which he wrote with his own finger? Uh, Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 to 11. I'll wait a few well, minutes for you to grab it. Yeah, it says that we shouldn't labor or do our work on the Sabbath. See? So we have six days of the week that we should work, but on the seventh day, we shouldn't work. Mm-hmm. That's what, yeah. Why don't you go ahead and read the, uh, the commandment from uh, verse okay. uh, 8 all the way down to verse 11. Okay. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. 
Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger which is, that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Hmm. So, in this commandment, um, God commands us to observe the seventh day as his holy day. And God knew that, that people would forget his Sabbath, so he began the commandment with the word, remember. Okay. Um, he has never commanded anyone anywhere to keep any other day uh, as a weekly holy day. But this, he says, remember and keep it holy. Uh, what's also interesting is that um, if we take a look at Deuteronomy chapter 9 and verse 10, it tells us that then the Lord delivered to me, talking about Moses, two tablets of stone written with the finger of God. So this commandment um, was audibly spoken by God in Exodus chapter 20, and then it was written with the other nine commandments on the tablets of stone. So if you ask many Christians today, you know, do you think we should still keep the Ten Commandments? Most would would reply yes, you know, and, and uh, okay. but if, if you... If you yeah, but that's because most people don't know all Ten Commandments. But if you ask right, the, okay. the average Christian, should yeah. we keep the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not murder, um, don't commit adultery, honor your father and your mother, have no other gods before me. Most would reply, yes, we should keep the Ten Commandments. But the majority of the Christian world today is saying, uh, you know, when, when I say the Christian world, I'm talking about Christian world leaders are saying... Okay. The Ten Commandments are done away. We don't have to right. keep the law. And usually when they say that, they're talking specifically about the Sabbath. But how can uh, one commandment be invalidated from the Decalogue when it was written on the tablets of stone with God's own finger? Right. And, and, to, and to make the point a little bit clearer here, um, it was also audibly spoken by God directly. You see, most of the Bible is written through um, the content of, of uh, inspiration and revelation being transmitted to the prophet, and then the prophet writing it down in his own words, his own uh, you know, methods of speaking. Um, his, his, uh, you know, his cultural context will sometimes play a role in, what, in what's written. But the Ten Commandments were specifically written down and audibly spoken by God. So and when you were that's speaking the, about oh, sorry. Sorry. Oh, when you were speaking about um, the Ten Commandments and the Christian world leaders referring to one in particular when they say that we shouldn't keep the law, it reminds me of a verse in James. Um, first, uh, chapter 1 and verse, which is hard. Okay, in verse 10. No, chapter 2 and verse 10. And it says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. So I think that all of the commandments are important, or equally important, right. and that God expects for us to obey them in love, to obey them all. But, yeah. Amen. And if you look at verse 11, it says, uh, For he that said, Do not commit adultery, said also, Do not kill. Now, if thou committest no yeah. adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So, Paul, uh, so James had the understanding that if you broke even one of the commandments, yeah. you, were, you were a transgressor of the law. So it's so interesting, and, and when we look at what Jesus said about the Ten Commandments, I mean, we've talked about this a little bit this week um, in uh, the uh, live stream class on Thursday night about how Jesus said um, that whosoever shall break even the least of these commandments and shall teach men so shall be called least in the yeah. kingdom of heaven. So um, even the least of these commandments can't be broken, and people should not teach that they should be broken. But yet we find that the Christian world is doing exactly that today. They're teaching, okay, it's okay to obey nine of the commandments, but this commandment, uh, you don't have to obey it. So it's just interesting that the words of Christ are coming to pass even today, where he said that if anyone would, uh, you know, let's go ahead and read it. I'm going to just read Jesus' words on that, uh, on that subject. It's found in um, Matthew chapter 5. 
and uh, verse 19. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. And, uh, you know, we might as well backtrack two verses and go to verse 18, because I think that that's uh, very telling as well. Yeah. He said here, or, or you know, let's start with verse 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. So what does that tell us? It tells us that the law is very, very important to Christ and that, that he still expects for his followers to keep it. Amen. Yeah, that's true. So then that brings us to our next question. Haven't the Ten Commandments been changed? And according to Luke, 7, uh, Luke chapter 16, verse 17, which is actually a companion, to, a, a companion text to the one that we just read in Matthew, uh, it says, It is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one tittle of the law to fail. We also can look at um, Psalm 89 and verse 34, which says, My covenant I will not break, nor alter the, the word which has gone out of my lips. It's Psalm, Psalm 89? Yep, Psalm 89 and verse uh, 34. Okay. Okay. We can read that one again. So Psalm 89 and verse uh, 34. And it says, so my it. covenant. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Okay. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. Okay. I find that interesting, because I never, I know verses like, I am the Lord and I change not. And I usually use those verses when talking about things like God's law. But this is, I'm glad that you brought this up, because now I know this verse, and I can refer to it as well. But yeah. So what was it that went out of God's lips? What did God speak audibly? He spoke the Ten Commandments. He said, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And then he began to list the terms of the covenant. And there were ten terms. There were ten commandments. One of which, the fourth one, was remember to keep holy the Sabbath. So if God says that he will not alter the thing that has gone out of his lips, then... Can his commandments be changed? Yeah. But I, I really find it interesting that God says, remember the Sabbath day. It's, I guess he, I, I know that he knew, but I mean, it, it, it's so interesting to see that he, he, want, he wanted to remind us that it's, such an, it's an important day, it's an important part of our relationship with him. And he knew that many of us would forget, so he starts the commandment with, remember the Sabbath day. And then that's very right. poignant. Now, there's a lot of different uh, denominations out there that teach um, that in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, God gave the Ten Commandments, and that um, because uh, if we just take a look at Deuteronomy chapter 5, for example, um, they use this text to try to say that the Sabbath is only for Israel. Because if you look at um, verse, I guess, verse 12, it says, keep... I'll, I'll let you read it. Read uh, Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 12 down to 15. Okay. Keep the Sabbath day to sanctify it, as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. Six days shalt thou labor, and do all thy work. For the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thine ox, nor thine ass, nor any of thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. That, the, that thy manservant and thy maidservant may rest as well as thou. And remember that thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God brought thee, thee out then through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. Hmm. Now, 
let's look at this for a second, because a lot of churches are saying, oh, see, look, the only reason why God gave them the Sabbath was because he brought them out of the land of Egypt. This is clearly a command that is just for the Jews, because they were the ones who were brought out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, and so therefore God commanded, it to, uh, to, God commanded them to keep the, uh, the Sabbath, and to remember as a memorial that they were servants in the land of Egypt. So... Um, that's because people don't understand the way, the literary structure in which um, the book of Deuteronomy is written. There's something called the chiasm in, um, in the Hebrew uh, language and in Hebrew writing. And a lot of times what happens is that history is given, and it follows this, this, um, this style of repeat and expand. So when we look at Deuteronomy chapter 5, that's not Moses giving the commandments to the children of Israel all over again. That's actually a repetition. It's actually a repeating of the history of how they got to that point. Because when you start at Deuteronomy chapter 1, Moses kind of recounts the history of how the children of Israel got to this point, where they came from, what God promised, and how God brought them out of the land of Egypt and then gave them these commandments. So he's actually not commanding them specifically here. He's actually just repeating what was already commanded and the history that goes with it. It's not until we get to about chapter 6 that the new commands are actually given. So you'll notice that in this book, um, it's always repeated, you know, this book of the law, and, um, you know, you're going to obey the, cam- the commandments which I, which, I command the, which, which I command you this day. But um, it's written in the chiastic form where Moses doesn't actually begin giving the new commandments until chapter 6. When so chapter 5 and back... He's not giving the commandments. He's just repeating the history. That's, that has to be crucial. That, that's, a, that's, a, that's a key point here. Now, that being the case, when we look at Deuteronomy 5, Moses just gave the children of Israel an additional reason for keeping the Sabbath. Because he says here, six days you shall labor and, and, and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it, you shall not do any work. And he goes on to list very similar, in very similar language to the Ten Commandments given in Exodus 20. And he says, and remember, so this is the additional reason, that you were a servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. So in addition to keeping it because of, it's the seventh day and because um, of creation, the additional reason was redemption, because God right. brought them out of the land of Egypt, and he wanted them to remember that he is the God who saves them. So this wasn't the, you know, it wasn't that they were given this commandment because they were Jewish. They were given this commandment because God saved them. And, um, you know, in addition to its significance as the memorial of creation, he also wanted them to remember that he saved them. Okay. And it reminds me of a verse in Ezekiel. Uh, I'm trying to find it. I think... Yeah, Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 20. Mm-hmm. And it says, And hallow my Sabbath, and they shall be a sign between me and you, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. And I think that in this text, God is saying that I am the Lord. Okay, here's another one, actually. And it says, Moreover also I gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctifies them. And that's in verse 12. And I think that because sanctification is a part of salvation, the Sabbath and redemption, the Sabbath is also, this, in the, these verses show that the Sabbath is also a sign of this redemption that God is working in us. Yes, it is, uh, which gives us all the more reason to, to keep it. So I yeah. want to throw out a challenge there. Um, and the challenge is this. If people are going to say that on the basis of Deuteronomy chapter 5, that the Sabbath is only for the Jews because God said here, uh, or because Moses said here in uh, verse uh, 15, remember that you were a servant in the land of Egypt and that the Lord brought you out from thence with a mighty hand and a stretched out arm. So if we're going to say that the only reason why uh, the Sabbath was commanded at all was because God saved the, the Jewish people, he brought Israel out of Egypt, and therefore the Sabbath was just a memorial of um, his saving them, and that it serves no other function but to the Jew, and was only given because God saved them from Egypt, then you're going to have a problem, because if you look at Exodus chapter 20, 
it starts right. off with the reason God giving the people the, the commandments is because he brought them out of the land of Egypt. God said, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the, hand, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And then he begins to list the other nine commandments. So if we're going to say that uh, on the basis of Deuteronomy 5, the Sabbath is only kept because God brought them out of the land of Egypt, then we would also have to say that about all the commandments in Exodus 20, and that it's okay to lie, steal, kill, and murder, because the Jews were only commanded uh, to keep those commands because God brought them out of the land of Egypt, which we all know is preposterous. Clearly, this was God's okay. moral law, and he was commanding it to them, of course, because he brought them out of the land of Egypt, and he claimed them as his covenanted people, but also because these were the things that were right in the sight of God. These, were, uh, these commandments were righteousness, and God wanted okay. them to be, in order for them to be his chosen, they had to obey his law. Mm-hmm. God called them uh, in Exodus chapter 19 and verse 6 to be a kingdom of priests. So if they were to be the representatives of God, how would it look if they were breaking and trampling all over God's law? Okay. So, I think yeah. another verse... Oh. Right, go ahead. Hello? Okay, I think another verse that shows that the Sabbath as well as the law is not just for um, the Jews is found in Isaiah 56, this whole chapter. Um, But I'm going to read verses, uh, verse 4 to um, verse 6. And it says, For thus saith the Lord unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbath, and choose those things that please me, and take hold of my covenant." Even unto them will I give in mine house and within my walls a place and a name better than of sons and of daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord, to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servant, every one that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and taking hold of my covenant. And I think that these verses show that it's not, even, it's not just the Jews, but even quote-unquote strangers who are, not of the, uh, who are not a part of the Jewish nation, who came and joined themselves to the Lord, as the verse says, and decided that they wanted to follow God. Even those people who kept the Sabbath, they were blessed because they saw that it was something that, brought, that pleased God and it was something that he wanted them to do. Mm-hmm. And, and Jesus himself said in Mark chapter 2 and verse 27, um, the Sabbath mm-hmm. was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So Jesus at that point was putting the Sabbath in its proper perspective, but that he points out that he made the Sabbath for man. It was given to men, not not, not Jewish people, not just the seed of Israel, but mankind. Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, that moves us to our next question. Did the apostles keep the Sabbath? So we know that Jesus kept it and that it was his custom that on the Sabbath he actually went to the synagogue, which was their version of church, and he read from the scriptures in the synagogue. But did the apostles, even after his death and resurrection, did they still keep the Sabbath? Uh, if you could grab for me Exodus chapter 17 and verse 2. Exodus or? Mm-hmm. Exodus chapter, oh, I'm sorry, no, Acts chapter 17 and verse 2. Okay. Sorry about that. Acts chapter 17, verse 2. Um, okay. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures. Okay. So according to this, Paul had what custom? Uh, to go into the synagogue and to on the Sabbath day and to reason with the with the Jews about the scriptures. Mm-hmm. That's right. We can also look at Acts chapter 13, verses 13 and 14. Uh, now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia, and went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. Okay, so even uh, when they were on the road, they, uh, they, they traveled and they went to the, to, uh, to the synagogue on the Sabbath. Um, next is ex, uh, Acts chapter 16 and verse 13. 
I can grab that one. Acts chapter 16 and verse 13. And on the Sabbath, he went out of the city by the riverside where prayer was wont to be made. And he sat down and spake unto the women which, re- which resorted there. And last but not least, there's also Acts chapter 18 and verse 4, which says, And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded Jews and Greeks. Mm. So it shows us that when the Gentiles started to become converted, and by the way, a Gentile is simply a, uh, a word for non-Jewish. So even when people who were not Jewish uh, by descent became converted by the message of the gospel, um, they began to keep the Sabbath alongside the Jews and attended the synagogue every week so that they could learn more about this Jewish Messiah and that they could learn about the scriptures. So the book and of Acts another makes verse. It... Oh. Go ahead. There's another verse in uh, um, Acts 13, verse, verses 20, uh, 42 and 44. And it says that when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. So it shows, as you were saying, that the Gentiles were regular Sabbath keepers because they asked for the word of God to be preached to them again the next Sabbath. And in verse 44 it says, um, And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. So, yeah. That's right. Mm. So... It's clear that in the book of Acts, Paul and the, er- and the members of the early church kept the Sabbath. Even if they were Gentiles, they kept the Sabbath. So the next question would be, did the Gentiles also worship on the Sabbath, which we kind of already answered. Uh, we looked at, uh, at Acts chapter 18, verse 4, and um, I think you read Isaiah 56, right? Yeah. Right, so we, we pretty much uh, covered that, that uh, God uh, and his... Um, chosen people as well as the Gentiles as they began to learn about this, uh, this new faith. Um, they all kept the Sabbath. So um, wasn't the Sabbath changed to Sunday at Christ's death and resurrection? And if, if uh, not, how can we be sure? Yeah. Why is the majority of the Christian world keeping Sunday holy if the holy day that God blessed and sanctified is the Sabbath? And does it matter? Well, as it turns out, there is no scriptural evidence for the keeping or the, even the making holy of the first day of the week, Sunday. A person could search through Genesis to Revelation in vain and not come across one text that remotely suggests that the, sun, that the first day of the week is made holy or that man is obligated to keep it. Scripture is clear in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 11 that the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and he hallowed it, just like his name is hallowed. Yeah. And Genesis 2-3 tells us that God blessed the seventh day itself and sanctified it. And so because the day itself was blessed and sanctified and set apart, it's not made holy by whether or not men choose to keep it. The day itself is set apart. We can even look at evidence in, um, in, in uh, the New Testament. For example, uh, Matthew chapter 24 and verse 20, where Jesus uh, gives a prophecy, and he, he expects that his people will still be keeping the Sabbath in the year 70 A.D. when Jerusalem was destroyed. So let's take a look at that prophecy. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 24 and verse 20. Um, Ali, you can go ahead and grab that. And while you do, I'm going to just give some background information on what's going on here and why it was significant. Okay. The apostles um, had shown Jesus the temple. And he had told them that uh, there would not be, remain one stone upon another that would not be thrown down. The apostles realized that something was up, that this must be somehow a signal of the end of the world, and that something was about to change. They didn't know what, but they knew that something was about to happen. And so they asked Jesus, 
when shall all these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus begins to list the, in Matthew 24 the signs that would lead to the end of the world and uh, his, his soon coming. He talks about wars and rumors of wars. He talks about famines and pestilences. He talks about earthquakes in, all, uh, you know, in various places. And he says that all these are the beginning of sorrows. He mentions that a persecution would come and that men would be delivered up and hated by all nations because of his name. And that uh, they would be turned in by, uh, and, and betrayed by their loved ones and friends and family members. He mentioned that many false prophets would arise and would deceive many. And that because iniquity would abound, the love of many would wax cold and that things would get worse and worse. But he mentioned that whoever endured to the end, the same would be saved. He said that once the gospel of the kingdom would be preached to all the world, for a witness to all the nations, then the end would come. Now he focuses, by verse 15, he focuses attention back on the temple. And he says, When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whosoever reads, let him understand. Then let him which is in, which is in Judea flee to the, to the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take, his, to take his clothes. So according to Jesus, there would be this abomination of desolation that Daniel prophesied about. And by the way, that can be found in Daniel chapter 12. Um, and that once they saw that, that, that uh, abomination of desolation in the holy place, they were to run and to flee to the mountains. So, on whatever day that that abomination or, of desolation was, was, uh, w w would take place or, or, would, or would be seen, they were expected to leave and to flee. Now, let's go ahead and read verse 20. Go ahead, if you have it. Okay. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Hmm. Now, why would Jesus tell them that the day when they see the abomination of desolation and they were expected to run and flee to the mountains, why would he tell them that, to pray that it wouldn't happen in the winter or on the Sabbath day? It had to be that he expected that people would still be keeping the Sabbath. And if they were in the temple on such a day and the abomination of desolation was set up at that time, it would be really difficult to be able to leave the temple and then leave the city on a Sabbath and then flee to the mountains without being seen. Right. Okay. So Jesus expected 40 years after his resurrection, because remember that this event, when the abomination of desolation took place, was, on, was in A.D. 70. Um, okay. the, Ro the Romans came and they set up a standard, um, you know, on, on, the, on the holy ground, and that was a signal that, the, that it was time for the Christian believers to run and flee before the persecution began. So... Forty years after his resurrection, Jesus had expected that, the, um, that, his, that his followers, his believers, would still be keeping the Sabbath. We also read in um, uh, the New Testament about how um, once Jesus was crucified on Friday, that his body was in the grave on Saturday. And right. so... Christ's dead body um, was going to be anointed by the women the day after the Sabbath. So the women who were going to anoint his body actually kept the Sabbath because they could. Why not come uh, after Friday and anoint his body on Saturday, the very next day? They waited a day. They waited for the Sabbath to pass, and they came to anoint him on the first day of the week. So Jesus died on the day before the Sabbath, according to Mark chapter 15, verse 37 and 42, uh, which we now call Good Friday. That's uh, when, when people talk about Good Friday, they're talking about the day when Jesus was crucified. And the women came to anoint his body the day after, the first day of the week, Sunday. Why didn't they do it on the Sabbath? Because they were arrested. That's right. So even in, even in death, Jesus kept the Sabbath. 
Right. Yeah. Now, Luke, the author of Acts, doesn't refer to any change of the day of worship, and there's no biblical record of that change. In fact, in the book of Acts, Luke says that um, basically he wrote, uh, as he wrote his gospel, the book of Luke, about all of Jesus' teachings from Acts chapter, that's in Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. So if, Jesus, if Luke wrote all of the teachings of Jesus in the book mm-hmm. of Luke, yeah. Let me rephrase that again. I got a little tongue tied there. I meant to say, uh, if Luke wrote all of the teachings of Jesus in, um, in in the book of Luke, which he says in Acts chapter one, verse one to three, that that was his mission when he wrote the book of Luke. If he wrote all the teachings of Jesus, then how come he never once wrote about Sunday keeping or a change of the mm-hmm. Sabbath? Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Okay. Now. Question number nine, some people say that the Sabbath will be kept in God's new earth. Is this correct? Let's take a look at Isaiah chapter 66, verses 22 to 23. Isaiah 66, verse 22 to 23. Should I read it? Sure, go ahead. Okay. For as much as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. Okay, so this tells us that the, according to the Bible, the saved people of all ages will keep the Sabbath in the new earth. So we find that the Sabbath was kept from creation, it was created for man, and that it was set apart and made holy even before it was commanded in in the book of Exodus. Then in the book of Exodus, once God saved and called his special people, he commanded them not just to keep the Sabbath, but he gave them all the other commandments that they were expected to keep because God saved them. So it wasn't that they were going to earn salvation, but rather because God saved them, because he brought them out of the land of Egypt, they were expected to in response to keep his law. And so the same thing is true of God's people today. Once they're saved, they're expected to keep God's law. And so we find that when Jesus completes the work of salvation and uh, there's a new heaven and a new earth, all flesh will come to worship him and they will meet from Sabbath to Sabbath. So the Sabbath will be kept into eternity future. It was... It, it, it began as far back as creation, and God's people are expected to keep it today. Okay. So next week we're going to talk a little bit more on this subject, and we're going to get into some of the other uh, details about it. Um, but I think we made the, the points clear about the Sabbath's origin being with God, and that yeah. you don't have to go further than the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, And you're going to see that God created the world in six days, and then the seventh day he rested, and on that particular day, he created the Sabbath. And he created it for man to be enjoyed, where God rested from all his work, which he created and made, and he he sanctified and set apart this specific day as a memorial. You You could think of it as a birthday of creation. And I want to just kind of throw in a plug here about why the Sabbath is so important in today's age. Because we live in a world where the, the emphasis is on evolution and is on, you know, rather than intelligent design, people are thinking about um, chance and, and uh, just happenstance that everything is, is coming to being. And the Sabbath speaks to that issue. It tells us that we're not here by happenstance. We're here because we were put here by a divine creator who loved us and gave us um, life. And that life is celebrated every seven days in the Sabbath where we remember what God did for us in creation. And it carries the, the additional significance of um, being a time when we can remember redemption as well. And I think that also so, speaks. Ed, I'm sorry. I think it also speaks to our value um, as human beings on this earth because I think that to believe in evolution and you have to sort of 
agree that there isn't much of a value to our life, to who we are as human beings, because we just happen by chance. But with the, the theory of creation, with what we have in the Bible, we see that we were created by a loving God, by an intelligent God, who, who loves us, and who wants, a God who wants to spend one day a week with us. And we can ask ourselves, why, if we consider the size of the earth compared to the universe, we're just a speck. And to think that God, the God and the ruler of the universe, wants to spend a day of the week. And not even just that time. He has set aside this time because he understands that we have other responsibilities. But he has, he, he wants to spend time with us. And I think it's, it just speaks to our value and to, to how much God loves us and what he sees in us. Very true. You know, um, and I, I think that this is a, a crucial point for us today because the world needs to know that they're not here by chance. They are, they are here by design. Um, so many people are, 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 led, are led to feel like they have no purpose in life. They have no direction. Uh, no one cares about them. They're, they're here just, uh, you know, wasting time. And, you know, a lot of people commit suicide because they feel emptiness and they feel yeah. like they have no purpose in life. But yet the idea of the Sabbath reminds us that we were created for a reason. We were created by a God who gives us purpose. And so um, I think that it's all the more needed today so that people remember that there is a purpose for their existence, and that purpose is given to us by our Creator. Mm-hmm. Amen. And that he has the power to create the world in six days. See, a lot of people try to say, oh, well, maybe God didn't really create the world in six days. Maybe he created it in 6,000 days, you know, because they believe in that, you know, each day of creation is about 1,000 days. But we forget that God is God, and God has the power to create in one literal day something that might take 1,000 years, according to science. Yeah. So. The Bible is clear that God created the world in six literal 24-hour periods, six literal days, the evening and the morning. Mm-hmm. And so if he has the power to do that, then can he fix our greatest challenges and our greatest circumstances? Of course. Of course he can. Yeah. So with that said, uh, we'll close out for this week, and um, you know, we'll pick up next week with the second half of this lesson. Okay. Um, Abby, would you like to pray for us? Okay, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity that you've given us um, on this year Sabbath day to study your word and to, to, to learn more about you. I thank you, God, that you've given us this day of rest to spend time with you and to spend time with our family. And I just ask, God, that you would please continue to um, help us to keep this day holy in your sight. I ask, Lord, that you please be with those who may not know the truth about your Sabbath day. And I ask, Lord, that um, you would teach them the truth about this day. I thank you, God, for everything, and I pray that as the week is about to start, that you please continue to be with us. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Have a great week, everyone. And uh, we'll be back again next week, same time. Uh, discussing the second half of the lost day in history. God bless. Thank you.